And we are back with Mark Hernandez. And boy, the, the Wayne Red Rum's getting a little, uh, I don't know, I think it's because it's fucking hot in this place. He don't like this shit. He's getting pissed. How was he when he walked Dude, in? Dude, what's up with it? That thing oh, freaked me the gnarly. fuck out, man. Yeah, I don't fuck you with him. You see these eyes looking at you. I don't fuck you. with him. He doesn't fuck with me. We have this <laughs> understanding here, and I just kind of leave it at that. Uh, he's never moved or went on anywhere or died, so I figure... You know, although we don't have a rat problem here, so I think that he's like, and he's that fucking big, people, so we're going to caricature him on the next t-shirt. So. I need an escort out, people. Yeah, you just may. You have Some people come in and they fucking, where's the fucking spider? It's huge. And I'm like, like, again, I leave him alone. He leaves me alone. There's an understanding. We do a show here. He's on it sometimes. It's the it's, best it's, way it's, to it's, be. It's, it's, it's in the contract that way, you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's all good. So we were, um, when we left off, you were at the uh, high school and you were playing yeah. in, in, the, in the high school, but only one, this was the last time, right? That was it, man. It was one and done. Now, did you ever do any other bands that played in the clubs up until you went into... Violence? I did not, you know, because one of the things, uh, my pops was very protective about like me going out and, and getting involved in that kind of stuff, you know, which probably saved me a lot from doing things I shouldn't have been doing at that time yes yeah you know and at I mean? that time but my name had gotten around enough to where I had been you know asked to come check out other bands you know and uh, so uh one of the ones was let's see back in probably right around 92 uh 90 we were in 1990 so right around then after Silent Cry kind of fizzled out um there was a local kind of uh band on the scene in the Bay Area called Screwdriver Smile don't remember them. and they were uh they were kind of like uh they were that bluesy not quite glam but bluesy kind of uh rock and roll you know and uh so i remember going down to uh out to audition for him because the bass player that had played with silent cry had joined this band right and they had made him shave his mustache and you know what i mean it was all about your look right totally. so here i was especially that i had the peach fuzz growing in you know what i mean and you i had can't have that i had big big bushy hair and I'm a heavy player, right? And so not even though I appreciated that music, I didn't really understand about it because here I am coming from a technical aspect point and uh, aspect and how can I make this musically interesting, right? Cuz that's where I was at, not how can I make the song sound good, you know? And so I went and auditioned and it went awful, dude. It went absolutely awful. I remember walking in this guitar player's like got this long noodly hair, you know, and pretty boy and uh was he cool he was kind of a dick to me oh you know? wow i i guess that's uh, what wow just, huh the whole way yeah. huh so that was like you know like that was the divide between the glam guys and like the metal guy you know what i'm talking yeah, about sure and so that's like I, I i knew i wasn't gonna get the gig but i gave it a go anyways you know um but then uh another band uh black avenue they, uh, I think Chris Densmore, who's in, uh, who was in Mud, he's in Mudface uh -huh. now. Yeah, Chris. I think that I was Chris. one of his bands, and yeah. um, it was actually the first time I saw our current bass player James Walker's band, Alistair. It was the same bill. It was like uh -huh. a Wednesday night at the Stone, and they were getting ready to lose their drummer, so they were like, you know, wanted me to come check them out, and that's right about the time the grunge was picking up and and starting to come in, you know. So there was the Boots and the, uh, you know, the Flannels, and I'm depressed and. Shit. You know, <laughs> um, I hated it. I dude, I hated it. You know, it, as a metal guy, I just just well, that's what we were it. talking about. It took the showmanship and it took the <sighs> the I'm going to be entertained to you know. I mean, I could see this guy you know at some diner and you, it, all the mystery for me kind of left. I it I, I, I have to agree with you. There was always this mystique. I wouldn't say mystery. I would say mystique right. that there was and. Grunge was like, oh, yeah, 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 we're going to play the gig, and then everybody's going to go get a burrito, and I'm going to stand in line with you in the truck. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, you know, I, I just, can you look a little bit like a rock star a little bit? What's with the, I mean, Kurt Cobain, I just used to, I, I you know, I know the guys, everybody loves him, and he's great, and he was, there's so much Nirvana stuff that I love, but when they first came out, I was like, why does he have that really gold sweater that my grandpa used to wear and the white shirt under it and he just looks like you know he i don't give a fuck like ah, just thrown together this is like punk but 
the guitar sounds really metal, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And there's no leads and... That's another thing. Ugh. Oh, God, that's a whole other subject. You're taking out my lead guitar. I man. know. Come on, I grew up on this. Richie Blackmore, Michael Schenker, Ted Nugent, Jimmy right. Page, Eddie Van Halen, and now you're going to just play rhythms? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Come on. So I, I, I know. So... So go ahead, go go. I, I had I need sorry. So, I had to interrupt to do that. I needed that. I love Sometimes it. Sometimes I had to do that. So all you their <laughs> comment, whatever they they give me the time limit. They say it at forty two oh two. You like they let me know when I fucking did it. So good, tag that one. <laughs> go ahead, Mark. <laughs> uh, you know, so Wayne's uh, fault. Was it Black Avenue? I'm trying to remember, man, because it gets it gets. I get confused with that because I really didn't do too much outside of. Being a you know studying with uh, Jeff Campitelli, playing in the school band, and then you know working. I was, dude. I was like the poster child for just say no to drugs. I was, I was a good kid, you know. But um, so after you know those auditions didn't go well and whatnot. Um, right about the time I'm about to graduate, I uh, was gonna, I got into Berkeley School of Music. Which is, you know, yes, that's a big deal, Very right? Very prestigious, yes. And uh, so, but what happened was, um, I had some family issues that happened, which made me reconsider going. And uh, so, I ended up somehow uh, getting a phone call from uh, Carl Albert, of all people. You know what I mean? And the mighty Carl Albert at that, because the mighty. We that the mighty. fucking dude is one of the most amazing singers I've ever, I've ever had the pleasure of playing with. Uh-huh. And it was him and a, a bass player named Johnny Din, and we were just about, you know, Carl would play guitar and sing, and we would get together uh, in Hayward off Clawwater. This is where Carl was living. The in, rehearsal spot. Yeah, and uh, and we would just do Kiss covers and smoke weed, and you know, and that's what we would do. With Rocco and Steve Lagridi? I don't remember they who would fade place. in and out, but uh, there's a big stage in there and yeah. all the way at the end of the... Uh, you know, that's where Metallica did the the, the um, uh, rehearsals for um, or the auditions for... Uh, for Bass player. Uh, for Cliffs. Really? Uh, yes, at there at the rehearsal spot. Fuck. Mm-hmm. That's some legendary shit that I just learned. I was there. I was there when that happened. That's Because yeah, we were doing Legacy still, so... And, and, and Greggy had one of the auditions, but they were in the back room. And let me tell you, one of my favorite things about the Legacy demo is that I believe it's side two is in mono. There's a side two? There's a... I bought the demo at Rasputin's. I have a, I have a gift for you before you leave, so you're going to really like that. So you're going to like this. I actually just... I've had them for a while, but I just got a new thing. I'll show you. With awesome. I've done. You, awesome. You're gonna, if you, speaking of legacy demo. But. Fantastic. Uh, so I was jamming with those guys, and uh, that's kind of where I started, you know, dabbling with smoking weed or drinking beer and what. Dabbling, mind you. Dabbling. Just yeah. dabbling. Yeah, dabbling. <laughs> we'll get to the rest of that in a little bit. Um, and so we would just sit there and, and, you know, I remember Carl's favorite one to jam was Baby Driver. And that was for me off off rock and roll over. I was kind of, wow. even though Peter influenced me so much, he was my least favorite member of Kiss, bro. You know what I mean? I think for everyone. I think for everyone. He's like, you know, and, and I love Ringo Starr too, but. He was your least Beatle? <laughs> your least Beatle? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I hate to say that, but dude, I got to speak my truth, man. Um, and Why? So, because there was no talent in drum playing at that point in time, right? really? And so uh, what had happened is one night uh, Ryan Logsdon came by and everybody, you remember Pigs, right? Yes, of course. What a band, man. Great band. And a that had Vic, thing, singer. Yeah. Oh, my God, dude. Uh, what did they call him? Fat, fat Bastard? Fat Pig? Yeah, he was a very big guy. Jesus but Christ, Ryan but his sing. voice was oh, like... Oh, man, he could sing his ass so off. So he came game. by one night when we were jamming and hanging out. Victor Victoria was yeah, Victor Victoria from Sister Strange yeah, was a drummer, was right? Drummer. And Brent Weeks and That's Yaz. Right. That's right. Yaz, Yaz was playing yeah. guitar. And so he came by one night and, you know, I met him and whatnot. And um, so I got a call from him one day and he was like, hey, man, you know, things aren't working out. Well, Vic, we want you to come down and, and audition. And this is like my first time. Mind you, I'm I'm... 18 uh-huh. want you to come down and this is my first introduction to the paradigm studios and for those of you who don't know the paradigm studios that is like a nugget in time that will never be duplicated again ever uh, yeah a lot of good shit and a lot of a bad lot shit of in there. <laughs> you know what i have to be honest 
I I was there very few times because I didn't have my Exodus rehearsal studio was across town. You guys are smart. And I went <laughs> the few times I went there, I didn't. I had bad times there when I went there. Bad vibes every time I went there. It was a very drug induced place. It, it was, was yes. Like, it was just. Like, but this is where my story starts to take a left <sighs> turn, right? Because this the people I'm going to start to meet at this point forward changed the trajectory of my life experience and my playing experience from here till now you know um so i went down there and jammed with them and victor even though from the glam scene victor had a really killer groove man and for that heavy music they were doing something that i thought was really cool because they were heavy but then they had melodic parts and ryan's voice just like great singer. it took it to another really level great singer you know and uh so they had me come down and again still i'm from this heavy you know uh this young kid i'm full of you know anger and semen and <laughs> you know and uh so i go and and they bring me in and i'm jamming with them and still you know they're still working on me to try to hit that sweet spot that groove right well on a side note uh bruce who used to run that place uh you know god bless him man he uh, came in one night, and this dude comes through our rehearsal space, and uh, he's all, hey, you know, says hi, and then he goes upstairs with Bruce, and Ryan looks at me, and he goes, you know who that was? And he's like, that was Leonard Hayes. And my fucking head was, like, exploding, because here, you know, to me, at 18 years old, these are rock gods. This was fucking yeah. the guy with the fastest Single right foot, foot in the ever game. in the game. You know what game. I mean? Fastest right foot ever. Totally. Ever. You know, and and my buddy and I, we used to cover Double forever. Bass if you, if you bum, 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 bum. God, that foot just can you know, move. Long, greatest guitar R. run R. ever from Dave Mancini, man. Come on. So, um, you know, my head's blowing up. I'm like, oh my god, I just, I was in the presence of greatness, you know. And it was during these rehearsals with these guys that uh, one night I happened to. Uh, Phil Dimmel came into the rehearsal studio and, uh, you know, he had, he's friends with all those guys, obviously with Yaz and Brent and, and Ryan. And, uh, you know, he was a little agitated and I don't, I don't know what was going on in their camp, but you know, for me now back up a little bit. The first time I heard eternal nightmare was like, that was for me, that's almost a changing point in the game because what they were doing, Sean's delivery, Sean's lyrical content. I mean, it was Harry's attack, right? All those fills, you know, like it was. Believe me, his playing in that band for me, in in the best possible complimentary way I can say, is like a skateboard with loose trucks as you're going down the steep hill, right? Because it just felt unsafe, and at any point, this fucking thing's going off the rails and you're bailing, right? And I, I really grasped onto that. They had this energy about them, man. Oh, yeah. And it was... And Sean, man, it just made it unsafe. And, and people either love or hate him. And I was instantly... I love this dude. You know what I mean? So for that, for him to walk in was like, oh, oh my God. And this was after oppressing the masses. Sure. And, and they had... Uh, um, nothing to gain hadn't been released yeah, yet. It hadn't been released, right? Yeah. So we're talking 92. They're writing it, I believe. I think it was being written right there. Uh, it might have been, or it might have been already uh, recorded. So we're you, talking, didn't, you didn't play on nothing to gain I then. did not. I thought you did. No, no, so no. So Perry did. did he did. did. He did. And, you know, I'm friends with Michael Rosen, too, so hearing both sides of the recording sessions of that is fucking great. Uh -huh. As a music fan and as a fan of the band in that era... It's so amazing. I got to get him in here to have all that knowledge. I'll, I'll, I'll give you Michael Rosen he's, in here. He's fantastic. I, when man. I had Lars Fredrickson in here, he would because he works. He with works Michael with him too. Yeah, a lot. And so I got man, I, the testament. There's stories with him. So, totally, totally. So I got to get him in. Um, so you know, having him come in and it was like we took a break at that time, went outside, and then you know, Phil was kind of standoffish. You know what I mean? I, I think uh, Phil's a really cool guy, but at that time. There was shit going on in that camp that, you know, they took a break because they were at that blowing up point, you know, and here comes Sean Killian and, you know, I'm sitting in the back of a pickup and here's these two dudes that I'm like, I'm just like, ah, you know, don't say something stupid, you know, just, just be cool. Just be cool. Just be cool. And, and so, uh, cool. Sean had actually, uh, hung out for a little bit while we, while pigs rehearsed and, uh, you know, 
nothing of it after that well what happened was ryan one day this is still in the era of uh answering machines i got a call one day on my answering machine that well you know man uh victor's decided he wants to come back and you know it was really great and uh you know we had, i was like answer machine you me, fucking huh? fired me really? over on an answering, answering machine, machine? Oh, we fired what a machine, sh- yeah. you, know, you know i mean jim martin got fired by fax so i mean at least really is a human voice that's what i'm told that's what i'm told don't count that as fact, all right? And if you're fact checking, let me know if I fucked up. No, they'll, they'll believe me. <laughs> I can guarantee you. I said I think the other day that the violent record came out in '89, or Eternal Nightmare. Oh, they were. <laughs> it came out in '88. So oh, you know, what are you stupid? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I get it. I, I know you're watching, guys. Uh, so the, you know, right around August. So I graduate in in June, July. And I have these experiences with both Carl Albert and Johnny Dan. Wow. And I know. It's like I turned down going to school, had a family event that changed my trajectory, and then all this stuff starts happening. And then, uh, you know, I get a call from Sean Killian, which, like, you know, is is amazing. I'm fucking 18 years old, and Sean Killian calls me and uh, asks me, you know, if I'd be interested in coming down and uh, auditioning for the band. And I was like... Oh my God, are you kidding me? And being a huge fan already, those were things that I had practiced, right? You know, I mean, it was part of my repertoire because the music I loved would be music I would play. And uh, so uh, I remember this, and um, Rob was already out of the band. He was doing the machine head right, right. at the time. Uh, uh, Ray was already. And Ray was Ray, in the band. Ray was in. And so uh, it's funny, Ray reminded me of this story. He's like, this fucking guy, he shows up like with his graduation tassel hanging on his, you know, rearview mirror because that was a cool thing to do, right? I mean, so Hot. what what he what <laughs> that was for the first practice with him what it, what most people don't know is that my mom drove me down to the paradigm no studios way. to pick up the audition tape from those guys hi everybody that's my mom yeah totally. hi, mom right and uh so it had uh ageless eyes atrocity um what was the other one from there I don't think it was Color of Life, but it was a fast one, so it might have been uh, Virtues of Vice, maybe, which has a slow intro, but uh-huh. then picks up at the end and goes full violence. I don't think it was 12 gauge. Anyways, so that, and then um, I took it upon myself, being an overachieving high schooler. I had like 12 songs ready to go, so by the first time I went down there, I had not only studied those songs they gave me, but I was like, you know, it was funny because it was like... Uh, I instantly got on with them very well. You know what I mean? Like, I think as musicians, me coming in there and showing the respect for the music by abs- uh, by being competent and playing it, you know, because at the time they were auditioning people and it's like, you know, they had told me about one guy from Santa Cruz and they're like, so what do you do? And he's like, oh, I smoke weed and play drums, bro. <laughs> oh, that's an act. <laughs> you know, and, and I remember, I Phil, I remember Phil telling me that um, this guy too, he'd be like, well, you know, Eternal Nightmare. And Phil was like, do you know eternal nightmare <laughs> you know um so by going in there and playing and uh like instantly i had the vocabulary you know what i mean and it was put in a good place and uh they were like i think at that first rehearsal showing up and having an arsenal of their stuff like well let's play this one let's play this one you know with minor tweaks or whatnot um so you were able to play oh yeah even uh, stuff up and beyond what they were expecting you to play yeah they only gave me they asked me to like three or four three or four but you went through you went catalog on them totally totally yeah you know and it was like i felt it was respectful that way sure i mean like i I would have been like wow this guy knows our own i don't even know our own shit you know what i mean (laughs) wow i gotta read and read look he knows it you know so um they continued they had me come back and then you know i left my drum set there and it was like you know i uh they said uh you know we got the show coming up and uh you know we we need someone to play it it was like well cool i'll rehearse with you and if it works it works right and uh so uh you know we we rehearsed off of uh san Le- in san leandro where sean and dave dell lived and um uh, why am i blanking on her name it was cliff's cliff's girlfriend uh, and they Karina. all yeah and they all live there right and uh so i'd show up for practice like ray said with my graduation tassel i love your graduation tassel and these dudes are out back hooping and i'm like what 
the fuck? Because, I mean, you know, there's sports guys, too. Phil right. is like, he's a jock, yeah, man, that fucking shreds. He grew up in Dublin. Yeah. We all played sports yeah, here. Totally. You so grew up here, you This is a trip sports. for me, man. These guys are hooping in the back, and I'm like, all right, I guess I'll, I'll play. Not very good, but, uh, you know, so the funny thing is, is that it came time to get ready to do the gig. And, and mind you, this is like, uh, I don't want to say ominous because that's kind of bad, but it's uh, foretelling. It was a co-handling gig at the Omni with Violence and Forbidden. And uh, wow. I know, right? This is my first, this is literally my first gig ever. You know what I mean? Besides the other small sure. shit, you know, this is my first gig. And dude, what a gig, right? Like, it's like a wet dream, you know? And, uh, and packed too. Yeah. And so sure. I could hear these guys like a few nights before the gig, right? And uh, I heard him talking on the stairs, you know, and I could hear, hear them, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if Phil was fully convinced yet, you know, because I had had some conversations with Sean. He's like, well, you know, here's where Victor comes back and Phil still wants to audition Victor Victoria. And I'm kind of like, man, like, what the fuck do I have to do to get this gig, man? You know, you know what I mean? Phil and I played with Victor. Did you? We had a band called... Um, it was called Assailant. And for nine months, Phil and I and Victor played in Victor's garage before I joined Legacy. Right before I joined wow, Legacy. Wow, okay. Phil and that, so that would be... There's the connection. You, there's the connection yeah. right there. Okay. That's why, because when we first said Victor, I when we were talking about, I knew Victor because Phil and I had a bet. We never played gigs, but we had like 11 songs. And right when we were going to play a gig... I went and joined Legacy, and so the band dissolved, but we that's probably where that came from. And another interesting fact, I mean, this is kind of sad, but, uh, you know, as, as everybody knows, Carl Albert passed away. He and Victor were in the car that night coming through the tunnel. Wow. I know. So that's that's, uh, that's where he pops up. Wow. And, and when like I was... Jam- triangle, man. Yeah, and when mm-hmm. I was jamming with Carl, go back a little bit. I had a 1959... Uh, Chevy pickup step side that uh, my dad, like I said, he's a self-made businessman, owns a body shop. And so we built this truck and it was a custom truck at a 350 and it was raspberry red. It was fucking awesome, right? And I'm like, you know, again, that feeling like I'm, I'm the shit, right? And so Carl, I had a girlfriend at the time up in, uh, uh, not Santa Rosa, Jesus help me out here, uh, Angels Camp, Sonora. Sonora. And so I would drive up there, and I had no idea Carl's from Sonora area. I didn't know that either. So his boy, Kevin, lived up there with his mom. And so we were chatting, and so Carl and I would take trips up there. I'd go see my girlfriend, and he'd go spend the weekend with his kid, right? And uh, so I'd say, go ahead, you can borrow my truck, man, you know? And, and he'd go mobbing, you know, Kevin around in the truck and... You know, so it's, it's a cool little side note there to be able to be part of that history because I, I know Kevin now and he's an amazing musician as well. Uh, so um, when we were, uh, it was about the two, three nights before the show and uh, these guys, are, they're going to make a decision, right? So they go outside and they're on the steps and I kind of hear them, you know, and hanging out and, uh, you know, and. I know, I think Phil was kind of, I don't know, man, you know, and Sean's like, dude, he learned 12 fucking songs, you know, like, and so till this day, people, I will let you know, I was never officially asked to join the band. So you've never like, so they never came in and said, what Sean Killian said to me, the gig. Sean Killian said to me, he said, he sits down and we're on the drum rise and he's like, so you want to do the gig with us or what? And, uh, you know. Is the gig the gig or the gig or this is the gig as this gig? Well, I guess you can interpret it two different ways, yes, right? Yes, because that's how I'm looking at it. I've always interpreted it as you want to do the show. The concert. Yeah. So maybe you're right. Maybe. I'm looking with the glass half full. Yeah, you are. You, you, that's the way it is. Because it's one of those things that's always bummed me out a little bit. I was like, those guys never said, no, dude. you're not looking you, at it that way. I know, you're, you're right. Hey, you, you, I'm sorry, gentlemen. This is the gig. <laughs> you got the gig, so you want to do the gig, meaning the gig. And I, so, I mean, it's kind of cliche to go, so, bro, you want to join the band? Yeah. So he was being cool. He says, so, you want the gig? You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. That's how I have to take it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And you know what? 
you've just changed history for me. See, see Thank now you. you now you can have, now you'll have better sleep sleep than I, I now you want to think will. about that. See, so just uh, come to the vault. We we transcend. We get this all out for you. They decipher what goes on in my see? head. See, spent time. So uh, yeah, so I was like, fuck yeah, man. You know, I mean, this is what and this is ninety two. Still ninety two. Still yeah. ninety two. And so uh, so the night before the show, uh, um, we're uh, we're rehearsing. And Rob Flynn comes to the rehearsal. Rob Flynn in Ginevra. And uh, so there's a part in TDS right before the, uh, in the middle of the guitar solo, excuse me, that's uh, triplets. Dun, 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 And for some reason, I kept fucking that up. And so here's my girlfriend and, you know, the band, and we're, we're playing. And um, so before Sean's like, keep fucking it up, man. He's all, I bet you $2 you fuck it up this time. And there's... Rob and Ginevra there kind of, you know, Rob's kind of like seeing, let's see what these guys are about now that I'm gone and Perry's gone, you know. And uh, But Machine Head wasn't a band yet. No, they were. They were a band. What year? This is 92. They were just starting but because I remember Chris Contos had played drums for Exodus in 93 and we were bringing their demos down there. We were bringing the Machine Head down. So you, maybe he was a band. I don't think he had anything recorded yet, did he? A 92? I don't machine know. Head? People, this is fact checking. There you time. go. There you go. You machine head fans out there, let me know because I'm not quite sure. So and you can rip on us while that. Please we do. Might as well. I appreciate it. Gives that. you a full open chance. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want that. Oh, they they do. want the sly they ones. They do. Fuck, take a hit this. at me. Uh, and so uh, Sean's like, fuck, I bet you $2. You fuck it up. Big bet. Yeah. And Phil's <laughs> like, I got a dollar. And my girlfriend wow, was like, I'll, I'll put a dollar. Wow. And I was like, okay, great. Pressure's on. So we get to that part. I fuck it up. So it's great, right? So lost two bucks. So the night of the show, uh, dude, my buddy and I, we started drinking margaritas at like 10 in the morning, right? And I'm so pumped about this thing that I just can't, I, like, I could not get intoxicated. It was like, I was on this other level of high to play this show at the... Can I just ask why? <laughs> why were we drinking margaritas? I know, right? on? That's why. I mean, why? I, w I worked at Costco with a bunch of college no, 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 guys. No, no, you played. Time. You played music all this whole time, and you didn't fuck around with anything. <laughs> you you played all these shiny little shows. You were a good boy. Doing? Yeah, right. You get your biggest fucking gig, and the morning of, you're getting hammered on margaritas. This is insight into how I work my life. Oh my. My best thinking, bro, has ended wow. me up in some wow. fucked up situations. Wow. Right. And so uh, I used to have this little Tasmanian devil on my drum set, you know, like Nico McBrain used sure, to have yeah. the animal. And so we set it up, we do sound check, and I remember this, this is great about Sean. Forbidden had rented like $1,500 in PA gear, these huge stacks on the side, and you know, we were, it was co-headlining, but we were going on first. And so I, this, is, this is my first uh, introduction into like Sean Killian and how I do business, right? And he was like, and they were like, no, you can't use it unless you want to pay for half. And Sean was like, then get that fucking shit off my stage. Right? So we got to like, if, if we can't use it, it has to go until right. you're on. Right. So we ended up with this, using half this huge PA, right? Um, so during soundcheck, after soundcheck, unbeknownst to me, Sean sees this thing and fucking <laughs> chucks the uh, Tasmanian devil. Tasmanian devil is gone, right? Wow. Yeah, right? Executive uh, uh, executive decision. Wow, I guess so, huh? Wow. And and I'll tell you what, Perry Strickland will say that he was not at that show, but I guarantee you he was, because when I look over as we're playing, there's some guy like this on the side of the drum riser, and if it wasn't Perry Strickland, it was someone who looks exactly like Perry Strickland standing there. So you talk about having pressure at the same time. The former drummer... Was it an amicable split for them? I don't know. That's why, for me, any of the three times I've been tossed out of Exodus, <laughs> I would have never gone to the gig. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Never. So you so, could be right. I, you know, that's kind of... Because your attitude at that point is like, fuck them. Why am I going to go watch some guy do my job? You know what I mean? But fuck this them. is a founding founding member of a band, and, you know, like, mm. let's see. I, I don't know. Okay, let's say, look at it this way. At least you thought that was the case. So oh, the, dude. So, like... So it was on. It so was nerves on, were on. It was like, oh, you like, are you fucking kidding oh, me? So we get to TDS, right? And it comes to that break. And it's a guitar breakdown again. And Sean turns around and goes, 
to the heart. I was like, oh, motherfucker. Hot. And you know what? I fucking nailed it. Did you look at him and go, I want my two dollars back? Right? You know, so I nailed it. So it was kind of like it was cemented, you know, at that point. And now that you've pointed out the whole gig thing. Yeah, see. Know, I have to look at it. Now, now you feel it better, see? I do feel better. Come talk to me, I will help you. Uh, uh, Sean's always been a, I mean, he's always been a super great guy to me. I, you know? He's been a super Phil, great guy Phil to well. everyone, and that's why yeah. when he was sick, everyone came to the call. Oh man. Killian we'll on Command that. was one of the biggest gigs I've ever played in the Bay Area ever, let alone just be a tribute gig and, and the whole Bay Area came together for that because he is a good dude. Yeah. Now you didn't last it it didn't last that it long. It didn't last. Down. How no. long more were once so, you once you got the gig? Yeah, yeah, right. How long more did that get? Yeah, I was but like, that, oh, you're yeah. talking about that butt. Oh, and then plummet. Yeah. So they were about to release nothing to gang. So this is where I, I met Debbie Abono and you know it was fantastic, man. What a wonderful woman, man. And and God bless her, dude. What she did me. for the scene is like Oh, I we could we we're we're doing We've been doing, well, we tried to do a full, get everybody's, we do, every time like getting you in, we do something on Debbie, and then we lost the hard drive. We lost all of these people talking about wow. Debbie, and we were going to do a whole episode on oh, all man. of these different, and we had probably 20 people that had come on as guests on the vault, and then we, when, when I said sayonara, goodbye, thanks for joining us, we just did a whole thing on like, give me your thoughts on Debbie, and oh. we lost it all. Everybody, what a, what a saint. I will do an episode on She's, her. Because she was amazing. I man. need to get Rick, her, her her son, in, and and I need to get Gina in here. You know what I mean? And get the, get the girls in here. But um, her mother was like, "Is that the spider? It could be. Ooh. I think it's a spider. Or man, a I hope that shit doesn't come through the wall, man. It could. <laughs> uh, hey, stop that. So one of the greatest things was Debbie, because here I am, I'm, I'm a teenager, man, you know? I mean, out in the great big world, and Debbie telling my mom, I'll take care of him, you know? And, and that was the truth. Yeah, that was the truth, you know what I mean? It, uh, she's, God, she was a one of a kind. Her and Angie with their Cannibal Corp shirts oh, on, man, <laughs> with their gray hair. Come on, I fucking know. amazing, man. I know, I know, I can go for so hours good. on Debbie, so good. me. Uh, so the whole plan was that nothing to gain was gonna come out, and we were gonna tour Europe. You know, and so they got the label and then all those plans fell through. So really up until, uh, you know, we went on and we formed Torque, like the dudes in the band had never been to, you know, violence had never been to Europe, which was one of the big things about that band. They were the, basically the only one that never made it over there, you know. Um, Killing it over there now. Holy <laughs> Killing crap, it over there now. dude. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, I bet you all are glad you waited. But, yeah, uh, you know, and so um, in the meantime, there were some songs written already, you know, and ones that weren't quite finished. So I ended up uh, recording "Breed Like Rats" uh, again. You fucking breed! Yeah, oh, geez. I love that classic yes, Sean Killian, right? Classic Sean Killian and Shooter, uh -huh. you know, and these were slower mid tempo. Well, "Breed Like Rats" Breed was wasn't, was pretty was intense, right vocally was right and everything in yeah. your fucking face. And so uh, we did this at Rocking Horse Studios in uh, Petaluma. Uh -huh. uh, you know, a little 16 track, hot as fuck in this little studio. And let me tell you something about Sean. I'm sure you know this, but rehearsing with him, one of the craziest things for me was that the way you see him um, performing live was him all the time. So he had this stack of amps and whatnot that he would sing behind because he would be down like getting into it. And watching him record that demo was like, a, a great experience he said you know in shorts you know no shoes no socks and he's like writhing on the ground a feeling, lot of people do that feeling this you know what i mean it was like a whole experience for him to get this out and and that demo for me man it was like still people to this day you know they'll say like oh man was that perry and sean will be like no that was our sharky man you know and it was a cool experience to have at least a little piece of history with him you know um, but shortly after that, Sean was like, you know, I'm done, man. Like, right. And then that's when Phil decided to be the singer and you went along with him, but you were the only one to go along with him, right? No, no, no. Dean, oh, Dean that's came right. along Dean, too Dean. and Ray. Oh, but so it we, basically was violence without Sean and you yeah. know, doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But we had thought about that too. And Rob was having, at that time, so we're talking like 93, 94, Rob was yes. having great success with machine it. it was just starting yeah. and he was he was killing it you know what i mean and so 
the whole thing of guitar players singing now was it was kind of becoming a thing you know and so phil and i had talked about it because uh you know who could we get to to sing and one guy that we had both thought about was ron reinhardt from uh dark angel Uh because we both dug his delivery and and his attitude about it and uh so we had agreed that you know he was going to give it a shot and if it didn't work out we would we would seek out ron reinhardt but uh you know it worked out now how long did that go the actual torque because torque went to technocracy so right? somewhat somewhat, somewhat they, kind of, you know you followed that trade there I you did and, i did you did but how many years was torque actually four maybe uh, so we're talking like uh it was like 99 was like technocracy, the, the technocracy right? era like, but there was a gap between me doing f-bomb with perry yeah remember that's right so they were, and uh was mike roberts in that too uh, for a minute for yes. just a minute yeah, okay just and that's minute. when we were yeah. back down at uh dan the dan, man yes yes hey dan man Fogel. that place had a vibe though i tell you I, I feel like i've been a part of writing some of the best music at that place there was just this weird vibe weird vibe and dog shit all over the place <laughs> fucking paul pick up after your wolf man that's where that's where paul passed actually was yeah. that place you know paul bailoff died at this rehearsal studio and uh it was infamous um, Tempo of the Damned was written there. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, you guys were all the way at the oh, end of the hall. And I always said, if this place catches on fire, we're dead. You know that because there was one no way escape. in. It's one way in and one way out. There was no escape out there, and that, that made me paranoid. And then look what happened a couple of years ago. A ghost ship, same thing. So, I, I, when that happened, I said to myself, Oh my God, Exodus dodged a bullet for like so many years because we were in that final back room all the way back there. If something happened in the front, there was no yeah. fire escapes in the back. You were cooking. Yeah. And I always thought about that. So, but like you said, there was a lot of good bands that were there. At Skin the Lab time. was Skin there. Skin Lab was there. Uh, uh, um, Larry's band too. Uh, uh, Matt at Sam. Matt at Sam was Inhalant. There. Inhalant was yes. there. Yes. Yes. There was, there was, uh, it was so many bands that that played there so mm-hmm. so i mean it was a definitely a there was a vibe there was a, a vibe. good vibe good vibe a mix of people who created people. music and people that lived there and years later we actually had a studio this uh a band i did called reignition was right across the hall from uh, gonna from bailoff we're going to take a break here with mark hernandez because we're going to get back in and then we're going to start talking about from technocracy and all <laughs> into that other stuff when we come back mm-hmm. 